coming today. It's my pleasure to introduce Mito Ravinsky, who's, a, who's a, a man that um, we as architects probably in some respects love and probably fear just a little bit because of the different things he does. He's an author, he's an architect, he's a professor, and he's a critic. He was born in Edinburgh, raised in London, attended Jesuit schools in England and Canada. He studied architecture at McGill University in Montreal, where he has also taught. He is currently the Martin Margie Marison Professor of Urbanism at the University of Pennsylvania. His architectural experience has included designing houses as a registered architect, as well as researching low-cost housing for which he has received the 1991 Progressive Architecture Award. In 1993, he was made an honorary fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He has honorary doctorates from McGill University and University of Western Ontario. In 2007, he received the Vincent Scully Prize, the Seaside Prize, and the Institute of Collaborative Honors from the AIA. He has been described as one of our most original, accessible, and stimulating writers on architecture by a library or journal. He has written 15 books on the subject, as varied as The Evolution of Comfort, A History of the Weekend, American Urbanism, The Development of a New Community, and The Search for the Origins of a Screwdriver. I'd like to hear more about that. His book, Home, has been translated into 10 languages, and he has won numerous awards for writing. His essays appear regularly in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. He has written for the New Yorker, the New Yorker Review of Books. He has been an architectural critic for Saturday Night, Wigwag, and Slate. I've just completed his book, which is on the screen, The Biography of a Building, How Robert Sansbury and Norman Foster Built a Great Museum. It speaks to the process of creating a new museum from the collector to the architect, as well as the friendships forms formed that lasted 30 years between them and three more projects. It's my honor to welcome Wito Ruchinski. Who doesn't know what he wants, what she wants, is, is 
going to be hopeless because they're going to, they're going to, the architect just doesn't know where, what to do. Uh, this is a biography of an art museum, and if I told you it was an art museum built by the descendant of a, a very wealthy family that, of, of storekeepers uh, and a, a personal collection that this person had assembled, uh, you would know what I'm talking about. And you should have a pretty good guess because there's one about three hours in here. This is very similar and also very different. It's a, it is also, in fact, uh, a family of, of grocers. Uh, and I wanted to start with this person. All great art collections start with money. I mean, great art costs a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money, you can make a collection, but it's not going to be a great collection. And you're probably not going to build a special museum for it. So money is at the heart of it, whether you're Alice Walton or Cosmo de Medici, you need money to do this kind of thing. And the story I'm telling you is about the Sainsbury family. This man, John James Sainsbury, was a, looks rather grand in this picture. It was painted at the end of his career. But he started out as a shopkeeper, very modest beginnings. He and his wife opened a, dairy sh a little dairy shop. By the time he was dead, he had about 150 stores all over southern England. So he's a kind of Walton story. Except they didn't conquer the world, they just conquered England. <laughs> it became the biggest grocery supermarket chain uh, in England by the 1960s uh, when this picture was taken. He had six sons, but his oldest son was his partner. And his oldest son had two sons, and they're the first two people in this funny photograph. Uh, and the hero of my story is the second person, Robert Sainsbury. Uh, the two brothers ran the business together. They were co-presidents of Sainsbury's. And uh, the first one was the sort of marketing genius. And the second one, Robert Sainsbury, was in charge of the personnel, uh, properties, real estate. They ended up employing several thousand people. Uh, and then their sons and cousins are sort of further down this row. And, and by the 1960s, they had got transferred from shops to supermarkets and uh, became the biggest chain in, in England. Uh, very successful, and of course, the uh, participants were very wealthy, especially when the company went public. It was the largest public stock off offering up to then in the, in the London stock market, so it was a major event. Robert Sainsbury, the second person in this photograph, uh, was a unusual person in, the, in, the, in terms of art, because there was no art in his family, there was no art in his home, he didn't study art, he went to Cambridge and studied history before he went into the family business. But when he was still a college student, he got interested in books, letterpress books, uh, and he actually sponsored a press. He, he wasn't super wealthy, but he, his family was very well off, and he, had a, he, he didn't have other hobbies, and his hobby was collecting letterpress books and sponsoring this press. You can see it. these are a couple of the titles. It was called the Gemini Press. Blair Houston was a relative, became a really famous person in this field. And that led this young Robert Sainsbury to start being interested in pictures. He was always interested in the graphic side of books, just how things looked on paper. And, then, and, the, and he started buying art. And the first thing he actually bought were two drawings by the artist on the top left-hand corner, uh, who's Joseph Epstein, who was a very radical British sculptor of the 1930s. And th th we're talking now about 1932, when Robert Sainsbury was probably 24 years old. He had just graduated from college, younger than he was photographed. And he later bought this sculpture, uh, also by Epstein, uh, and just started buying work. He didn't have any other hobbies. Uh, he was working in the family business. He had some side of him that wanted more than just being a grocer. And so he was very good at business, but he, it wasn't really his passion. And his passion became buying art. And he bought, he had no background. He didn't, and he didn't, certainly didn't hire consultants or anything like that. He simply went out and bought things. Uh, the thing that ties the collection together is they're all human figures. Some of them are tiny, they're little, little figurines. Uh, he got interested in, in so-called primitive art, as it was called then, African art, uh, ancient art, uh, but strictly from the visual. He, he, you know, he had no interest in anthropology or, or geography or anything like that. He just liked the way these things looked. 
And he accumulated more and more of these uh, works. And like many collectors, he was attracted to the artist as well as the art. And he met a young artist called Henry Moore, who was then still teaching in art school. Uh, they, he, he went to, a, I think, the second exhibition of Henry Moore's works. And they, they decided to meet the next day. They went around the exhibit. He picked one piece of art, which is this mother and child. And then they went out for lunch. Uh, and they became very good friends, lifelong friends. Uh, another artist that he, in a sense, discovered for himself, because these were not big names, and they were not particularly expensive, which is that's why he could afford them. He wasn't super wealthy at that point. Was Giacometti, and that's a drawing of, of Robert Sainsbury's son, made by Giacometti as, a, I think, a birthday present at one point. And uh, he he befriended these people. He, you know bought things for them. His wife, Sainsbury's wife, I remember he bought a raincoat for Giacometti because his raincoat was falling apart. So they were very close with these people. And the third person that Lisa and Robert, who are perched here, that's his wife, Lisa Sainsbury, it's a picture by Lord Snowden. I don't know how he got them up there, probably up a ladder or something. This is in their home, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the third unlikely person that they became very close to them was Francis Bacon was a real wild man of British art. Uh, and there was this side of the Sainsbury's that was very attracted to the radical, even though they were these absolutely middle, upper middle class storekeepers, basically. Uh, there was something that attracted them to very unusual art. And they became, again, very good friends with Bacon. Bacon was a completely under control sort of person. So, Robert Sainsbury had to underwrite his bank account and would sort of take care of it because he was really running out of control. And he made two portraits, and Bacon never made portraits of people, didn't, certainly not on commission. And, and the one on the right is of Robert Sainsbury that he painted, and the one behind them on the wall is of, of Lisa Sainsbury. He painted about six portraits of her, uh, which were not commissions. He was just interested in doing it, and I think he destroyed most of them. And he destroyed a lot of his paintings like, but they managed to sort of salvage this one and, and, for, and then sort of lean on him to, to sell it to them because they wanted to at least keep one of them. The house is very important, and as you'll see in a minute. They lived in a relatively small house in Westminster, not far from the Houses of Parliament in London, and it's a, it's a very narrow row house, only one room wide, four floors high. Uh, they had four children, so it was full of people, uh, and it was where they kept the art. So, Part of the reason for buying small things is they really didn't have a very large house. And David Sainsbury, one of their, their sons, said that, that he used to have a Henry Moore under the sink in his room at the top floor because it was the only place structurally that could hold a heavy sculpture. Uh, so many other things were rather small and they were very eclectic. They were, they were these, there was primitive art, there was Polynesian art, South American, old Japanese pieces, and, and then these very modern, contemporary uh, British art. They didn't buy so much old, they didn't buy older paintings. They bought paintings from artists, basically, or, or they, from artists they could meet and who were painting at the time. So they were surrounded by the art. Uh, here's some, you get a sense here, that on the top right hand corner is a is the dining room, which was paneled in wood, and there's a Polynesian club in the corner, and then there's a kind of Gothic sculpture. I think, I think that's a Ruo on the wall. Uh, so there was art all over the house. The, the top left is actually Robert Sainsbury's bed, which was kind of like a bunk surrounded on three, two sides by walls where he could put his sculptures. And you can see many of them were very small. Uh, and he would, he could go to sleep surrounded by all this stuff. And there's the Henry Moore in the the stair hall. Uh, here's a picture of the study with a little bit more of these things. So there were there were probably four or five hundred by the time they got to sort of retirement age. One of the interesting things about many people who collect, especially people who collect over a lifetime, not who vacuum up art the way Alice Walton did, but who kind of slowly just buy art, is they don't think of it as a collection. And Robert Sainsbury never thought that he was a collector. He just liked these things and he bought them. And he was, there's, I quote him in the book, he was quite skeptical of people who kind of 
acquired instant collections. He, he just said, I like this thing and I buy them and so on. And one, to, one year in 1963, they were approached by the director of the Museum of Primitive Art in New York, which was a, basically the Rockefeller collection. It doesn't exist anymore. The, the collection, he decided at one point it wasn't working as a private museum, and he gave it all to the Metropolitan. So there is a Rockefeller collection in the Metropolitan Museum of this art. But at that time, he was, they had two row houses in Manhattan, and the director came, had heard of Robert and Lisa Sainsbury's collection. He said, would you consider uh, exhibiting your collection of primitive art, not the paintings, uh, in my museum? And, and that was the first time that they started thinking of their art as a collection. Because once you see it in display, you kind of see it differently than when it's all over the house. And uh, the second major exhibit was this one in 1966. And, the Kroller Mueller Museum is a was a private museum now a, a state museum. Uh, Ellen Kroller Mueller was the had the largest collection of Van Goghs outside the National Museum in Amsterdam, and she set up her private museum. And I talk about that in the book. It's an interesting story. But uh, it was this museum that approached them and said, "Would you let us display your whole collection? I mean, not every single object, but the range of your." Paintings, sculptures, primitive art, modern art, everything. And here it is uh, in, the, in the museum. And, and that, I think, really cemented the, the idea that they had a collection. It wasn't just a bunch of stuff. We all have books, but we don't, most of us don't think of them as collections. They're just our books. So this is a kind of important step for them. And the person who designed that layout in Holland, where they were, Kroller Mueller Museum is, was Ko Yang Yi, who was a Chinese industrial designer, ethnic Chinese from Indonesia, whose family had emigrated to Holland. Uh, that's a sofa that he designed in 1968, still in production. As you can see, he's a very talented designer. He also did, his most famous project at that time was the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, the interior design. And they liked what he had done, the way he had displayed their art, and they be, like they did with artists, they became friends. And then when they renovated their apartment, the kids had grown up, they changed some of the rooms around, they, they hired him to do, to design display cases and do the interior and some furniture for study. So they were very close to him, and that's important uh, in a minute. So when Robert Sainsbury retired, There was the collection, what to do with it. And he, he had three daughters and a son. None of them were interested in having the collection. The son was just starting a family, and he said they couldn't imagine having all these precious objects with little kids in the house. It just wasn't, that wasn't on. And so nobody wanted the responsibility. So, and, he, and like collectors, they wanted to keep it together. They didn't want it to sell it off and have it disappear. So, the first thing they did was go to Cambridge University, where Robert Sainsbury had graduated from, and to ask them if they would consider a gift of this collection. And uh, they weren't the Sainsburys weren't very happy because the university said, "Well, we'll you know, the art will go in one museum, the anthropological objects will go in another museum." And they were just going to break it up, and so they weren't very convinced about that. And they thought. But they wanted to give it to a university. They, they actually thought about starting their own museum, but I think wisely decided that it's very hard to have a private museum to keep it going institutionally, uh, to give continuity to it. Um, after you die, particularly, when you're there, it's kind of lots of fun for, for them. But once they die, who, who kind of keeps it going? And somebody like Albert Barnes in Philadelphia discovered that. It, was, it became very difficult after his death for the museum to continue. And as it it you may have read, it's now going to be moved to a new building, which he expressed it didn't want in his will, but uh, there you are. So Sains the Sainsbury decided they would give it to a university so that young people could enjoy it the way they had enjoyed it. And they thought, why not give it to a university that doesn't have any art? Because Oxford and Cambridge both had old, huge museums. And so they decided to give it to a much younger university. I, I want to show you this just to as a reminder. This is the old Ashmolean in Oxford. This is the first building designed as a museum in the world. Uh, so the concept of museums dates from about the 17th century. And uh, Elias Ashmole had a collection of 
a whole range of stuff, stuffed animals, exotic prints, coins, sculptures, art. And he gave it to Oxford with the condition that they build a building for it. And they, Thomas Wood was a local builder architect, and this is the building that he built. Uh, and so there is both, a, there is a tradition of giving art to universities and then having special buildings for it. Uh, the universities, they chose, they, they thought, as I, as I said, that they would give it to a university that didn't have any art. And the British had built seven universities, the, the so-called new universities, right after the war in the 50s. Uh, and they knew one of the people, Frank Thistlethwaite, who's a, the vice chancellor of that university, was an Oxford don who was also interested in art. He's a, he was a historian of American history, had written a bestseller on American history, but he was also a musician. Uh, he was interested in music, art. So, so they hit it off. They became friends over the years. They went month late, they lent works of art to him to display in the library. They, they gave money to buy books on art. So they had a relationship. And he was at the University of East Anglia. He founded the University of East Anglia. He was their first vice chancellor, which is like a president of an American university. And the East Anglia University was designed by Dennis Lasden, who was a famous British architect of the post-war era. And it's, it's one of the most sort of architecturally striking of the early universities, because it's not like a traditional university. It doesn't have quadrangles or a sort of green campus like many universities, it's, it's designed like a big megastructure. Every single, this is what it looked like in the 1960s, and every single building here was designed by Dennis Lasden, and those kind of pyramids are the student residences, and then there's a walkway system that connects them with the buildings in the back, which are classroom buildings. So it's a very unconventional, very modern university uh, with, a, with this very strong architectural character. Robert Sainsbury gave the collection to the university, and he also gave them a million pounds, was it, I'm sorry, three million pounds to build a building. But he, being a businessman, he made a very hard contract for the university because he said, uh, we're giving you this, the money to build a building, but there are some conditions attached to that. One is that we are going to pick the architect, we are going to pick the site, and we're going to approve the design. In other words, it was really, he became the client, even though the university, in another way, was also a client. So it was a complicated relationship, which makes the story more interesting, but it was certainly very much his building, uh, particularly Robert Sainsbury, who was interested in architecture, although his wife also plays a role. She did very much in the collecting, but also in, in the architectural uh, project. At this point, Robert Sainsbury is retired, so he has time on his hands, and, and he really throws himself into the project and gets very much involved. This is the list of architects that the university provided to him. They sort of did some research on who had built museums recently. Basil Spence was probably the most famous architect in England at that time. He had built um, Coventry Cathedral, which had been designed in the Civil War. Uh, other architects there are architects who are building or have built museums. Some of them are architects who have built campus buildings. And, and right down near the bottom here, you see Foster and Associates. And that was a firm of Norman Foster. Uh, it's, a, it's quite puzzling how his name gets on there because he had never built a university building and he never built a museum. And in fact, he'd only built uh, industrial buildings at that time. Uh, I think. My best guess is that uh, it was Ko, the Chinese industrial designer, who suggested it. Because the first thing that Robert Sainsbury did when they decided to build a museum was to contact Ko and said, we want you to design the interior. And Ko was an industrial designer, but he wasn't an architect. So it was obviously they need an architect. And, and so this is what the architecture search is about. But Ko had met Foster. And aesthetically, they were sort of on the same wavelength. Most British architecture at that time was pretty awful. It was heavy concrete. Uh, it was not particularly attractive. Very influenced by Corbusier, but in a, in a kind of clumsy way. Uh, Foster hated concrete because he said it really wasn't the right thing for the British climate. So it's OK in the Mediterranean, but with a wet climate, it just gets moldy and gray and damp most of the time. Uh, and so maybe. It, there was a kind of synergy between Coe and 
Foster in terms of the sorts of design they like. So Cole most likely is the one who suggested Foster, and he, he got stuck at the bottom of this list, very much as an afterthought. Uh, Foster at this time was, was an architect that the architects knew about, but really nobody else did. He hadn't designed any major public buildings. Uh, but, he, but he was a sort of interesting architect that other architects followed his career. A relatively small house in Westminster, not far from the Houses of Parliament in London. And it's a, it's a very narrow row house, only one room wide, four floors high. Uh, they had four children, so it was full of people. Uh, and it was where they kept the art. So part of the reason for buying small things is they really didn't have a very large house. And David Sainsbury, one of their, their sons, said that, that he used to have a Henry Moore under the sink in his room at the top floor because it was the only place structurally that could hold a heavy sculpture. Uh, so many other things were rather small and they were very eclectic. They were, they were these, there was primitive art, there was Polynesian art, South American, old Japanese pieces, and, and then these very modern contemporary uh, British art. They didn't buy so much Old, they didn't buy older paintings. They bought paintings from artists, basically, or, or they, from artists they could meet and who were painting at the time. So they were surrounded by the art. Uh, here's some, you get a sense here that on the top right hand corner is, a, is the dining room, which was paneled in wood, and there's a Polynesian club in the corner, and then there's a kind of Gothic sculpture. I think, I think that's a Ruo on the wall. Uh, so there was art all over the house. The, the top left is actually Robert Sainsbury's bed, which was kind of like a bunk surrounded on three, two sides by walls where he could put these sculptures. And you can see many of them were very small. Uh, and he, would, he could go to sleep surrounded by all this stuff. And there's the Henry Moore in the, in the stair hall. Uh, here's a picture of the study with a little bit more of these things. So there were, there were probably four or five hundred by the time they got to sort of retirement age. One of the interesting things about many people who collect, especially people who collect over a lifetime, not who vacuum up art the way Alice Walton did, but who kind of slowly just buy art, is they don't think of it as a collection. And Robert Sainsbury never thought that he was a collector. He just liked these things and he bought them. And he was, there's, I quote it in the book, he was quite skeptical of people who kind of acquired instant collections. He, he just said, I like this thing and I buy them and so on. And one, one year in 1963, they were approached by the director of the Museum of Primitive Art in New York, which was a, basically the Rockefeller collection. It doesn't exist anymore. They, they collection, he decided at one point it wasn't working as a private museum and he gave it all to the Metropolitan. So there is a Rockefeller collection in the Metropolitan Museum of this art. But at that time he was, they had two row houses in Manhattan, and the director came, had heard of Robert and Lisa Sainsbury's collection. He said, would you consider uh, exhibiting your collection of primitive art, not the paintings, uh, in my museum? And, and that was the first time that they started thinking of their art as a collection, because once you see it in display, you kind of see it differently than when it's all over the house. And uh, the second major exhibit was this one in 1966, and, the Kroller Mueller Museum is a pro was a private museum, now a, a state museum. Uh, Ellen Kroller Mueller was the, had the largest collection of Van Gogh's outside the National Museum in Amsterdam. And she set up her private museum, and I talk about that in the book, it's an interesting story. But uh, it was this museum that approached them and said, would you let us display your whole collection? I mean, not every single object, but the range of your collection paintings, sculptures, primitive art, modern art, everything. And here it is uh, in, the, in the museum. And, and that, I think, really cemented the, the idea that they had a collection. It wasn't just a bunch of stuff. We all have books, but we don't, most of us don't think of them as collections. They're just our books. So this is a kind of important step for them. And the person who designed that layout in Holland, where they were, Kroller Mueller Museum is, was Ko Yang Yi, who was a Chinese industrial designer, ethnic Chinese from Indonesia, whose family had emigrated to Holland. Uh, that's a sofa that he designed in 1968, still in production. As you can see, he's a very talented designer. He also did, his most famous project at that time was the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, the interior design. 
And they liked what he had done, the way he had displayed their art, and they be, like they did with artists, they became friends. And when they renovated their apartment, the kids had grown up, they changed some of the rooms around, they, they hired him to do to design display cases and do the interior and some furniture for the study. So they were very close to him, and that's important uh, in a minute. So when Robert Sainsbury retired, there was a collection, what to do with it. And he, he had three daughters and a son. None of them were interested in having the collection. The son was just starting a family, and he said they couldn't imagine having all these precious objects with little kids in the house. It just wasn't, that wasn't on. And so nobody wanted the responsibility. So, and, the, and like collectors, they wanted to keep it together. They didn't want it to sell it off and have it disappear. So the first thing they did was go to Cambridge University, where Robert Sainsbury had graduated from, and to ask them if they would consider a gift of this collection. And, uh, they weren't, the same reason weren't very happy because the university said, well, well, you know, the art will go in one museum, the anthropological objects will go in another museum, and they were just going to break it up. And so they weren't very convinced about that, and they thought, but they wanted to give it to a university. They, they actually thought about starting their own museum, but I think wisely decided that it's very hard to have a private museum to keep it going institutionally, uh, to give continuity to it. Um, after you die, particularly. When you're there, it's kind of lots of fun for, for them, but once they die, who, who kind of keeps it going? And somebody like Albert Barnes in Philadelphia discovered that. It, was, it became very difficult after his death for the museum to continue, and as it, you may have read, it's now going to be moved to a new building, which he expressly didn't want in his will, but uh, there you are. So Sainsbury, the Sainsbury decided they would give it to a university so that young people could enjoy it the way they had enjoyed it. And they thought, why not give it to a university that doesn't have any art? Because Oxford and Cambridge both had old, huge museums. And so they decided to give it to a, a much uh, younger university. I, I wanted to show you this just to as a reminder. This is the old Ashmolean in Oxford. This is the first building designed as a museum in the world. Uh, so the concept of museums dates from about the 17th century. And uh, Elias Ashmole had a collection of a whole range of stuff, stuff, animals, exotic prints, coins, sculptures, art. And he gave it to Oxford with the condition that they build a building for it. And they, Thomas Wood was a local builder architect, and this is the building that he built. Uh, and so there is both, a, there is a tradition of giving art to universities and then having special buildings for it. Uh, the universities they chose, they, they thought, as I, as I said, that they would give it to a university that didn't have any art. And the British had built seven universities, the, the so-called new universities, right after the war in the 50s. Uh, and they knew one of the people, Frank Thistlethwaite, who's a the vice chancellor of that university, was an Oxford don who was also interested in art. He's a, he was a historian of American history, had written a bestseller on American History, but he was also a musician. Uh, he was interested in music, art. So, so they hit it off. They became friends over the years. They lent went, 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 went works of art to him to display in the library. They, they gave money to buy books on art. So they had a relationship. And he was at the University of East Anglia. He founded the University of East Anglia. He was their first vice chancellor, which is like a president of an American university. And the East Anglia University was designed by Dennis Lasden, who was famous British architect of the post-war era, and it's, it's one of the most sort of architecturally striking of the early universities, because it's not like a traditional university. It doesn't have quadrangles or a sort of green uh, campus like many universities. It's, it's designed like a big megastructure. Every single, this is what it looked like in the 1960s, and every single building here was designed by Dennis Lasden, and those kind of pyramids are the student residences, and then there's a walkway system with that connects them with the buildings in the back, which are classroom buildings. So it's a very unconventional, very modern university uh, with, a, with this very strong architectural character. Uh, Robert Sainsbury gave the collection to the university, and he also gave them a million pounds, what was it, 
uh, sorry, three million pounds to build the building. But he, being a businessman, he made a very hard contract for the university because he said, uh, we're giving you this the money to build a building, but there are some conditions attached to that. One is that we are going to pick the architect, we are going to pick the site, and we're going to approve the design. In other words, it was really, he became the client, even though the university in another way was also a client. So it was a complicated relationship, which makes the story more interesting, but it was certainly very much his building. Uh, particularly Robert Sainsbury, who was interested in architecture, although his wife also plays a role. She did very much in the collecting, but also in, in the architectural uh, project. At this point, Robert Sainsbury is retired, so he has time on his hands, and, and he really throws himself into the project and gets very much involved. This is the list of architects that the university provided to him. They, they sort of did some research on who had built museums recently. Basil Spence was probably the most famous architect in England at that time. He had built um, Coventry Cathedral, which had been destroyed in the Civil War. Uh, other architects there are architects who are building or have built museums. Some of them are architects who have built campus buildings. And, and right down near the bottom here, you see Foster and Associates. And that was a firm of Norman Foster. Uh, it's, a, it's quite puzzling how his name gets on there because he had never built a university building and he never built a museum. And in fact, he'd only built uh, industrial buildings at that time. Uh, I think my best guess is that uh, it was Ko, the Chinese industrial designer, who suggested it. Because the first thing that Robert Sainsbury did when they decided to build a museum was to contact Ko and said, we want you to design the interior. And Ko was an industrial designer, but he wasn't an architect, so it was obviously they need an architect. And, and so this is what the architecture search is about. But Ko had met Foster. And aesthetically, they were sort of on the same wavelength. Most British architecture at that time was pretty awful. It was heavy concrete. Uh, it was not particularly attractive. Very influenced by Corbusier, but in a, in a kind of clumsy way. Uh, Foster hated concrete because he said it really wasn't the right thing for the British climate. He said, it's OK in the Mediterranean, but with a wet climate, it just gets moldy and gray and damp most of the time. Uh, and so maybe. It, there was a kind of synergy between Coe and Foster in terms of the sorts of design they liked. So Coe most likely is the one who suggested Foster, and he, he got stuck at the bottom of this list, so very much as an afterthought. Uh, Foster at this time was, was an architect that the architects knew about, but really nobody else did. He hadn't designed any major public buildings. Uh, but, he, but he was a sort of interesting architect that other architects Followed his career. They love and their systems of louvers that control the amount of light that comes in. Uh, and it's a very, and then there are, there's windows at each end, and they put the cafeteria at one end and an exhibit area at the other. And the, the Department of Art History is sort of next to the, uh, they also introduced lofts and they were able to deal with some of the extra things that way. And, and here's what it looks like. It's a, it's a huge jump from this to a living room in a house. And so it's, it's hard to when you when I first went there, I was, I, having read about what they wanted, it was a kind of a shock to see this and, and to think that they started with their little house and they ended up with this environment. But what, what Foster has done is that he's made the art sort of surround people. So all the art is displayed on these movable panels. It turned out to be very important because the collection doubled in size from the beginning of the museum to the end of construction because they, they kept buying. And now the family was really wealthy. And so they bought, and they had more space. They, they, they sort of got very enthusiastic about buying. So they were able to kind of add some panels, move them around. The other thing they did was the see those seats. Museums in the 1970, if they had any seats at all, it was just a bench. Uh, so this idea of having comfortable seating where you would sit and read surrounded by art was very much Sainsbury's idea. That you, he wanted to recreate the notion that you could just go there and read a book. You didn't have to be about going there to look at paintings. And there, there were also tables, study tables with books and things, art books. And you can see this now in, very nicely in the crystal bridges. But it really starts here. 
this idea of a museum that's around, that the art surrounds you, but you can kind of relax in it and, do, and read a book, and it's not, not forced on you. Uh, it's, a very, it's about a 25-foot ceiling, so it's a tall space, but, but the art sort of takes its own place in it. Uh, you don't have rooms, uh, and you have this very nice, casual relationship with the art, which is, which is very much what Sainsbury wanted. The light is very beautiful. Uh, they, this was taken earlier. Today, like most museums, it's rather dull because curators are so afraid of light that they've kind of destroyed the experience of looking at art because you don't have, you don't have sunlight in a the museum. They very much wanted sunlight to liven it up because that's, that's how traditionally you look at art in houses and there's sun on the floor. And it isn't just gray. It's, it's a livelier atmosphere. And you can sort of see it in this photograph. Uh, here's the faculty club above. Down, down below is the art history department. And then there's another loft with, with exhibit space on it. So, on the, so it's a very open space. You can really see from one end to the other. And then at, at the other end is the student cafeteria looking out through these big glass openings. It's an extremely low-key building. I mean, you can hardly find a door. And in fact, it never had a sign until about five years ago. They didn't think the curators finally said, you've got to have a sign somewhere. So they put up one of those pylons outside. But there's no sign over the door. There's no, uh, the doors, there's actually two doors, one to the art, to the art history department area and the cafeteria, and one which leads more directly to the collection. Uh, but they're both treated the same. They're, they're simply these openings in this in this very anonymous skin. Now, this is, of course, before the iconic museum happens. So uh, this is a very different way of thinking of a museum. Even though it's a large, certainly a big presence architecture, the building doesn't make a big kind of architectural statement. And once you get inside, it's extremely quiet and very un sort of not overwhelming, which is hard to show in the photographs, but the art really becomes the focus of things. <coughs> Some critics of the times thought it looked like an aircraft hangar and thus have a little bit of that feeling. Uh, although this, the structure, which you can see here, is actually not visible inside the building. So even though people call this a high-tech building, it really isn't because the technology is very hidden. Once you're in the building, you've got these louvers above with the light coming through and more louvers on the walls, but you don't really see the machinery and you don't see the structure. So it's a, it's something a little bit different, I think, than high tech, although it's often referred to that way. When Robert Sainsbury turned 80, his son wanted to give him a present, and he said, you couldn't give him art, obviously, because that was not on. And he, so, so David Sainsbury had this idea that, that to kind of show his father that, that the museum would keep going in the future, that they asked Norman Foster to, to make a design. If, imagine that the, the museum is expanding. What, what would it do? And the idea was that they could then sort of put this in a bank vault, and then 50 years from now, an architect would want to expand the museum, and he, at least he would have an idea of what the original architect was thinking. And Foster made this really nice model of the end of the building, and his idea was to expand underneath, and then or make the building longer because it's a modular building. So the easiest way to expand it is to add a few bays. And in there, it's full of little lights. So it, it's like a birthday cake when you turn the lights off. And, and uh, Robert St. of course, was, was delighted with this because he, he liked the idea that they were thinking maybe down the road. And uh, every week, he and his son would have lunch. And so after the, after the party, he had, he, they had lunch. And, uh, Robert St. Maria thanked his son so much. He said he enjoyed the gift so much in the party. And then he said, let's do it now. Why wait? And David St. Maria said, well, you know, what could, you, what could he say? His, his father had, had, uh, was, was the source of all his success in life. And so, of course, he had to say yes. And he said it was the most expensive birthday present he ever did. <laughs> uh, and I think with, with the St. Maria's, this was now about 10 years after the building was built. Uh, they really enjoyed working with Norman Foster. They liked being part of that process. So for them, it was like another project, the last project they would do. Uh, so they were they were keen to, to embark on it. 
Uh, but they surprised the architect because they said, you know, we like the building the way it is. So whatever you do, don't touch the building. So the idea of making building longer, which for most architects, that's the, the, the theory, the concept of this building is that it can get longer. You know, you have more skylights and you can add on to it. But they said, that's what we don't want. We want it. You can, you can make an addition, but it shouldn't affect the old building. So they looked at many things. This is, this is what it looked like when it was finished. And they, they thought of building a building in those trees and maybe connecting it with a tunnel, but then the curators didn't like that. They said it was too far and it wouldn't be practical. They looked at underground buildings along the, the south side. Uh, but then they finally decided that you could build a building in front if it was underground. Because if you kept going, it was a hill. You could punch out of the hill at one point and actually get natural light. One of the things they needed was more offices for curators because the staff had gotten bigger. Most of the new things were not galleries, but really back of the house things, workshops, storage, uh, an open storage, which they, but also offices. So by pushing up, because the hill went down, they were able to get a glazed piece at the end. So you, you sort of have to imagine this is all underground behind connecting with the building, and then you've got this, this sort of huge glass angle thing sticking out, which, which then brings light in, and you've got offices behind there. That was also attractive because you, you didn't have to close the museum while you were building this. This wasn't connected to the museum except underground with the basement, but the public entered it in a different way, uh, and you can see them here excavating the whole thing. Uh, there was an open storage, which was a new idea at the time, so you have very dense storage, which is not like the museum, but where people can see the collections, but they're not in a kind of traditional gallery setting. They had seen this, I think the Metropolitan was one of the first museums to have open storage like this, and the Sainsbury's visited America regularly, and they saw that, and, and at the, typically at the last minute they said, we, couldn't we have an open storage, and so of course they had to rearrange. Uh, and replan the building. Uh, Foster at this point was of course a very different sort of architect. He, was, he had built the Hong Kong Bank, which kind of put him on the scene internationally. Uh, a very big building. He built the Reno building up there. Stansted Airport, which is sort of people have compared to Sainsbury Center because it also has skylights above. It's a kind of one story big open space where the whole airport takes place on one level and it's naturally lit from above, which is, which is a very influential concept. Most new airports today follow that concept one way or another. But he was a, clearly had become a very famous architect at a much bigger office. And you can see the difference in the design of this, what became called the crescent wing because of this crescent at the end. And this is, the, this, this is looking down that crescent. The offices are on the right and the, the glazing, that the angle of glazing is on the left. Uh, but this is a very different architecture from the, the first phase of this museum. You don't see any, it's very slick, very, very, very perfect, uh, extremely expensive. This little addition cost as much as the original building. So the very, uh, but and very beautiful. I mean, beautiful lighting and then this, this curve going around. Uh, it's very nice. And the offices are, are very nice because you, you've got sort of view. Uh, the grade, grade is actually here. So you're sort of, when you look out, you're actually looking across the lawn down to a very beautiful view. There's water down there. Robert Sainsbury died in the year 2000. Uh, and on Lady Sainsbury's 90th birthday, uh, she, she also got a present related to the building because she was in a wheelchair by now and she visited the building once and got wheeled down this long ramp that led to the crescent wing. It was pouring with rain and she got wet and complained and said, how do you mean people have to go down on the outside? It really doesn't work. So David Sainsbury hired Foster to try to solve this problem. And there's sort of sketches of trying to cover this long ramp. And it's, you can see it's kind of awkward. She also, he also, wanted to provide sort of a roof at the entrance, which, which was also a problem. The building is, the doors are just, it's just a wall with doors and it's raining, which it does make a little lot when you're at a block and you're waiting for a taxi or something, it just doesn't work. So, but it's kind of awkward. It's, 
clumsy. It doesn't really make the building very nice. But at the same time, they had the building was now getting 30 odd years old. They had to replace mechanical systems. Or things could, weren't very efficient uh, compared to what we wanted today. Uh, there were things that just worn out. So they decided to do a major retrofit. And at that point, they said, why don't we punch through the building and really connect the underground part with the above ground part? Uh, and that's what they did, and that's what you see in this drawing. You now have a bookstore punched down from the main building, and then a, a connection so people would actually walk down. There's some classrooms there, exhibit space. There's the, the open storage area and a, and a temporary exhibits gallery there. There's, there's space for public programs, which are a big part now of the, of the museum, which were not there before. And here's a picture of breaking through the floor. You can see that the building is kind of almost the way it was when it was being built, because they've stripped out the interior louvers and taken out most of the mechanicals and are putting in more efficient, up-to-date mechanicals. Uh, and of course, with Foster's architecture, since it's all bolted together, you can do that. You can take out something and just bolt something else, or, or, or remove the mechanicals and, and upgrade them. It's a very strange building to visit today because it's a building in the 1970s that looks brand new because it is brand new. Uh, they restored the interior. They didn't treat it. They treated it as if it was a historic building. So for instance, the furniture is all restored, but it's the same furniture that was there originally. It's a Finnish company, and they simply replaced all the furniture. Uh, the, the exhibit panels are replaced, but they're exactly the same panels that were there originally. Uh, and here we're looking down the same spiral stair that was there before, but it's now continuing down into the bookstore, which you can sort of glimpse down here. It's a Henry Moore that was in the garden of the, of the Sainsbury's country house, and then was eventually given to the university and moved here. And we're looking into the cafeteria. I mean, the, the Sainsbury Center really succeeded as a building. Uh, a lot of buildings are built which have great architectural histories, but which turn out to be awful buildings or unimportant sort of institutions or, or almost failed institutions. Whereas the Sainsbury Center has, has become a very important uh, place. The uh, Directors of the center have gone on to be directors of important museums. The director of the Sainsbury Center when they built this underground extension is now the director of the Barnes in Philadelphia, and he's overseeing the new building there. Uh, and in fact, the new director of the Sainsbury is a person who was director of the Corcoran in Washington, D.C., and they got him back in the sense he was English. Uh, and so they're now actually attracting um, directors from large, important museums. Uh, the, the school has become renamed itself the School of World Art <laughs> because it has this incredible resource of, of these, uh, this, this collection of primitive art and, as well as modern art. Uh, and it's, it is considered one of the top research places in, of that sort uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the new director, of course, has come in and said, we, we have to rethink things so that as we speak, Foster's office is working on a sort of phase four, which didn't make it to my book. But uh, you know, they've decided that maybe the, ba the basement isn't the best place for the bookstore. Uh, I think they're changing the cafeteria to, to make to attract more business. Uh, in the in the meantime, the faculty club sort of disappeared. Uh, that has become more part of the exhibit. New research areas have moved into the university. So the flexibility of the building has turned out to be really a big plus because it's, it's not used at all the same way as when it was designed. And yet it's, it does manage to absorb this kind of changes in use, which all buildings do. All buildings change in use, but not all buildings kind of deal with it very well. Sometimes you, you have to modify them in a way that sort of changes the original idea. But Foster's idea was always that buildings have to accommodate changing future uses. And so this building does that. And I think it does it in an excellent way. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions, if there are any, about this.
this or other subjects? It's a very tricky thing because, and a big part of my story is there, there are lots of tensions between the university, the Sainsbury's, who still support actively the Sainsbury Center. But of course the Sainsbury Center is also a university building now, and it houses a teaching department, uh, which was very unhappy when they first moved there. Uh, I, I quote a, a sort of memo that they sent to the university describing what they wanted, and what they wanted was a kind of Oxbridge offices with paneling and sort of easy chairs and the kind of university environment that you imagine in a British university. And what they got was this kind of high-tech office environment, which, which they hated. Um, and, then, and now they sort of come to terms with it. Uh, basically, that first generation has retired. Uh, and, and new, younger people are coming in. And uh, they didn't like the openness. They, they didn't like having sort of visitors to a museum wandering around where you were teaching. Uh, and now they've got used to it. I mean, they've seen that they, and they've also exploited it rather than resisting it, which, which the first sort of generation was kind of very resistant to the idea that a visiting museum might be looking down at your classroom group or something. Um, the, so the new, the new director just has ideas about how the museum part of it ought to be run. Uh, and then because the Sainsbury's Foundation is so actively supporting the building. All this work I'm showing you is being paid for by them. Uh, he actually has a big influence on the university, and um, so I think his ideas about how the, the cafeteria area might be used uh, affect sort of non-museum parts. Uh, but there, but the, during the construction, there was a lot of tension because Robert Sainsbury was a businessman, and he was used to. You know, somebody makes a decision, so somebody carries it out. And the university, nobody makes any decisions. <laughs> Definitely nobody carries anything out. It's like, we, we kind of we talk, and then eventually a kind of decision happens through some magic process. But that used to drive him nuts. I mean, he was really, he, would, he, he had very good relations with the vice chancellor. So ultimately, that was how decisions happened. But as the building sort of moved from being his, his own building to a university building, you know, and he had to step away from it. That, that was not an easy uh, moment for him, or, or for any sort of major donor who <coughs> funds a building. Um, I mean, there's going to be a moment when Crystal Bridges will become an institution and not a private person's museum. Uh, it probably happen after she dies, but it, it's a ma that's a major moment in a, build, in a building's history, because then it, it, somebody has, it, it acquires its own life. And, and it goes often in different directions, but if you think of some of the great incidents, the Courtauld School in London is a great art history place, which started also as a private museum. The Barnes sort of didn't succeed as a private institution, as a teaching institution, but it may yet. So I guess in another 20, 30 years, if, if things go as they hope, then it, it would also be not just a great collection of things, but also a, a great teaching institution. So it sort of varies. The <coughs> Isabella Stewart Garden Museum is another private museum which has, has, has succeeded and one reason it succeeded is that Isabella Stewart Gardner, it's a private museum, doesn't belong to a university, but in her will she said you're not allowed to change anything. And if, if anything goes wrong at the museum, it goes to Harvard. So Harvard is watching very closely. <laughs> and she knew that. And she knew that that was the guarantee. That if anybody messed around with their will, you know, Harvard would just step in because they would love to have that collection. Uh, Barnes, unfortunately, wasn't that pressing. Plus, he got killed at, in a car accident, so he wasn't planning to die. He was there, there considerably longer. And, and, uh, but his will was much more wide open. And in fact, it was broken. And so the, his collection is now moving toward Second museum, but we'll see what happens. It's uh, the sort of the architectural life and, and the institutional life at one point sort of have to continue. Yes. Architectural question on the end of this building, uh, you can see the cafeteria, and then there's a lot of girder work. Is the girder work outside? Is that just yes. a steel frame? There's no glass on it. Or no. What happens is 
That is the structure that you're looking at, but on the interior it gets covered over with a kind of louver type of arrangement. Okay. And then on, on the upper part, they're real movable louvers, so the light comes in. But you don't see the structure inside. It's right. only on this sort of porch. So in, in this picture, then, you go up, you follow the glass to the top of the glass, and then what, there's another wall above that that closes off the interior part of the framework? Um, there's a wall back there that there's a piece of solid wall. The glass that goes up to the underside of the trusses yeah. and meets the ceiling. Yeah. But there must be, I, it's a good question. I've never looked carefully. There must be a solid, some solid. Yeah, just on the glass. Yeah. Yeah. These, are, by the way, are a very early example of structural glass. Uh, Foster, particularly in the early days, was very innovative. The exterior of this building was, was this very unusual aluminum material. Uh, and the end walls are structural glass, so it's, it's big glass sheets and then glass at right angles providing the structure, which is a common enough detail today, but in 1974 it was one of the very earliest examples in Britain, and certainly the biggest. Now, the sheets of glass were just the biggest sheets you could find. And that was like the limit of the industry at that time. So he, would, he really pushed the limit uh, took major risks, and I, it's too complicated to go into here, but I describe in the book, uh, I mean, there were some failures in this building, and that, that's also important, you have, where the client understands that there's a scene where he, he explains to Sainsbury, there's always going to be problems on your building. It's not a perfect process, and even if we try to be perfect, things will happen. So he's, he's sort of preparing him. And, and Sainsbury, at the same time, took responsibility because a client ultimately makes decisions with the architect. And if the architect's honest, the architect will explain that this, we're, we're trying something new here. I think it'll be wonderful when it's done, but it's, an, it's not been tried before. And so Sainsbury felt you know, he had pushed Foster to try things. And one of them, when one of them failed, he felt responsible to, to support him. And, and in fact, they did. And they, and they remain, I mean, as, as right up till today, uh, they remain involved in the project in, in terms of expanding it and modifying it and so on. Yes? As an architect and a author, what drew you to the story? You know, all the things you've about. Well, I, I explained this in the book. Books come from, for me at least, from many different directions. Um, I wrote a book once if I build my own house and, and that book started because I was telling this story to some I was in China on a trip and you know it was nothing to do with it. Was, this was 30 years ago. And so I was sitting around in this college sort of residence. And so I told him the story of building my house and, and he said, that's a wonderful story. Why don't you write that down? And that was the first moment no, nobody had ever suggested that. I hadn't thought of it. It, it had all happened a few years earlier. So that one started that way. And another book that's uh, the same as the Olmsted book started because I was sort of looking for a design person to write about. I, I wanted to try a biography just to try it. And I, you know, most architects don't write much, so it's hard to get archival information. They, they don't save their letters and they don't write books generally. Uh, and I came across Olmsted, and I lived in Montreal, so I knew who he was. And, and so on, and, uh, and then I discovered that he actually had written whole books, and there, were, there was a very big archive of all his, you know, the Library of Congress had all his letters, and so, you know, I got drawn into it that way. Uh, in this case, the book really came from the Sainsbury's, because my, my agent was a friend of theirs, and they, David Sainsbury was talking to him and said, you know, we, we think this is an interesting story, but do you, do you, who, is there anybody who might write about it? Suggest and, and he suggested my name and I met them. I went over there and one is I liked the building. Uh, I discovered that Robert Sainsbury had kept everything. He was a businessman, so he just kept every piece of even after he retired. He just kept all his letters, memos, guest lists, thank you notes. It was everything was there. So that was a terrific archive because I knew that the architects wouldn't be very helpful. He might keep a few business letters, but most likely they wouldn't have a lot. But he did. Uh, and then there was also 
Before he died, over a period of about five or six years, this, this young professor that he had befriended taped interviews with him, a sort of living history of, mostly about his collection, how he, they sort of went through all the years, starting when he was 20 years old, and where all the pieces had come from. And this, this uh, it was an anthropologist, had actually worked on the catalog of the collection. It's a three volume, two, two or three volume catalog of all the entire collection. Uh, and he was, and, and he, I got on with him very well, so he was a good resource. But this book was very good because Robert Sainsbury was dead, so I couldn't really speak to him. But he, there was this, this series of conversations, which was a little privately published book just for the family. And that, that really convinced me because his voice was there and he sounded like such an interesting, everybody loved him. He was a very really attractive person in that way. But he, he was this mixture of a businessman, very down to earth, with this strange side to him that loved art and just, but he, but he had, was very analytical about things at the same time. At the same time as he was quite impetuous about the way he bought art and the way he judged art and so on. So uh, that, I think that those were the things that attracted me. And I've always, I've written several books about the process of architecture. It's very hard to write those books because they're either historical in which case you have lots, you have the historical record, but you can't talk to anybody. Or if they're, if you want to talk to people, it's hard to get access to everybody and where are they. And so this was through the family, I was able to get access to a lot of the people who are still alive, Foster, of course, but many of them, he was quite young at the time. All the people who worked for him were around, the engineers still around, so some of the university people. So there was a lot of interesting sort of research that I could do just interviewing. So it was a long project, but it was a, a chance to sort of unravel, at least in for one building, sort of partially unravel like how it happened. So. <coughs>